Okay, Precog C, welcome back. We ended class, um, well, I called it a cliffhanger, but really I barely gave you time to think about it. Um, uh, trying to explore the function f of x equals x to the fourth plus one. Seems like a very simple, easy function that we should be able to, to understand. And uh, of course, uh, this function, x to the fourth plus one, well, it looks like the x to the fourth function, but you know, moved up one. So something like that. And obviously it has no uh, real roots. Uh, and the fundamental theorem of algebra says that uh, every polynomial has, <clears throat> every nth degree polynomial has precisely n complex roots. So if this is a fourth degree polynomial, then we would expect it to have, uh, since it obviously has no real roots, we would expect it to have four non-real roots. Uh, by the way, some people, um, including uh, our textbook, uh, it's pretty annoying, say, for complex roots, uh, but, you know, every real number really is a complex number, so uh, you shouldn't say complex if you mean uh, non-real, and in this case I mean non-real. Okay, well, what are these non-real roots? Uh, and, of course, uh, every complex number can be written in the form A plus BI, where A and B are, are real. So... Um, yeah, so what do we do? Well, okay, usually most years I give the class five minutes or something to, to try this, and they try all kinds of crazy things, uh, and okay, let's try to summarize. What's one thing you might try? Well, just kind of using your, your wits or something, you might think, oh, well, maybe like it's like I or something. All right, but of course that doesn't quite work, right? Because if you plug in I, well, I to the fourth is actually one, so F of, of, of I would be I to the fourth, uh, plus one, that would be two. So that's that sort of doesn't work. That's not that's not a root. Uh, and and negative i is not going to work either. So it's something else. And, and sort of your your next uh, thought is, well, okay, it's like what you want it to be is like square root of i, kind of, um, because uh, if you try to to plug in the square root of i, well, then uh, if, if you take the square root of i, kind of like you know, squared, but then squared again, which is to say to the fourth, now things are starting to do what you want them to do because, you know, then you have i squared that's negative one, so this, this would be zero, but all right, um, I'm sympathetic uh, to, that, uh, to that answer, uh, and uh, well, okay, sure, uh, but uh, that's not really an answer because it's not even obvious that the square root of i, like, what, what is the square root of i? Um, is the square root of i even like a complex number? Um, well, every complex number can be written in the form a plus bi, where a and b are real, and and this, um, at least at the moment, is, is not actually written uh, in that form. Uh, and so you can think of actually, uh, so that's not a terrible answer, but uh, you can think of what we're, what we're doing right now is we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the square root of i? Is that a complex number? And if so, let's write it in a plus bi form. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, uh, I bet some people would figure this out if I gave them more time. And, uh, and actually, uh, you already know how to do this. This is not really a new thing. It's an old thing, but presented in a new context. And okay, I know, especially for, for this year, that uh, last year in pre-calc B, uh, because, because of the pandemic, you maybe missed some things. And, and uh, so... Um, so I think it's worth it to review this, and this really is a kind of a topic of polynomials. And the answer is, um, the solution to this is to use this thing called de Moivre's theorem. De Moivre's theorem. And this is uh, sort of coming from, from maybe out of nowhere, uh, potentially, uh, for you. Uh, this is that thing which I mentioned uh, last week, that every real number can be expressed in the form r cis theta. Okay, so let's just kind of do this whole thing sort of all over again. Uh, if you have uh, co uh, any complex number whatsoever, and that complex number is a plus bi, this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis, well then you can express that complex number in what's called, uh, people call it polar form, people call it trig form, uh, call it what you want, uh, but uh, all right, if this, is, um, if this is a and this is b, then this is r, and this is theta, <coughs> and um, uh, so, uh, okay, and, and there are all kinds of relationships here, of course, uh, that r is just root uh, a squared plus, plus b squared, and, and theta is, you know, arctan, something, something like that, but uh, you can sort of, uh, well, 
you can well let's maybe we just maybe we just start. Well, you can write so so R cis theta is just an abbreviation for R times cosine theta plus I sine theta. And um, what we really want to do, I suppose, is, uh, is, is, is think of uh, this, um, think of every complex number as being fundamentally decomposable into um, the distance from, yeah, the distance from uh, the, the, the origin uh, on the complex plane and the angle. And so, uh, thought of it this way then, of course, if this is r and this is theta, then this is just r cosine theta, and this is r sine theta. And so, um, uh, r cosine theta is really just, is really just the, the real part, uh, a, and r sine theta is just the, the um, uh, imaginary part. Okay, I'm kind of going too slow here, but, uh, but, but r cosine theta just is a, and r sine theta is just b uh, times i. So this is maybe uh, hopefully something that you, you already kind of learned last year. And so um, when, I write a, um, when I write a complex number in uh, r cis theta form, it really just is just a normal complex number, a plus bi, but instead of talking about a and b, uh, I'm sort of expressing the, the real part and the imaginary part uh, in terms of r and theta, which I think of as being more important. Okay, why is r and theta sort of more important than, uh, than a and b? Well, the reason is because of the geometry which I mentioned um, the other class. Um, when you multiply two complex numbers in polar form, or trig form, uh, the angles add and the magnitudes multiply. So let's just do this right now. You did this last year, so this is just total review. But if you give me um, r1 cis theta 1, I guess, uh, I guess we're, we're not scared of, uh, uh, of, of subscripts in this class. If you multiply r1 cis theta 1 by r2 cis theta 2, in other words, take an arbitrary complex number in polar form and another arbitrary complex number in polar form and multiply them, what uh, happens? Uh, well, it's just a matter of cranking this out. Um, what is r1 cis theta 1? Well, of course, remember that that's just shorthand for r1 cosine theta 1 plus i times sine theta 1. And r2 cis theta 2 is just shorthand for r2 times uh, cosine theta 2, I think I'll leave off the parentheses, uh, cosine theta 2 plus i sine theta 2. Uh, okay, and well, now I just perform those multiplications. So um, R1 and R2 are just numbers, they're just real numbers, so I can pull those out front. And now I just have all this stuff, so okay, I just do it. Cosine theta 1 times cosine theta 2, well, that's just cosine theta 1, uh, cosine theta 2. And then I have cosine theta 1 times I sine theta 2. Uh, and I have, uh, well, okay, I guess I'll just, okay, let's just start. So I have I uh, cosine theta 1 um, sine theta 2. Cha cha. And then plus I sine theta 1. Uh, cosine theta 2, and finally I have i sine theta 1 times i sine theta 2, that's just i squared, so that's minus sine theta 1 sine theta 2. Okay, what is the, the, big, uh, the big sort of picture here? The big picture is, well, this is r1, r2, if we group these now, what's the real part of this complex number? It's cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, minus sine theta 1, sine theta 2. Well, that certainly looks familiar. Uh, yeah, it's just the formula for the cosine of a sum. So this is cosine theta 1 plus theta 2. And this is minus, um, no, not minus, uh, plus i times Factoring out the two terms that have i's in them, this is, I guess I'm up here, sorry, plus i times uh, 
sine theta 1, cosine theta 2, plus cosine theta 1, sine theta 2, and yeah, that should also be sort of immediately recognizable to you as the formula for the sine of a sum. So this becomes I sine theta 1 plus theta 2. And, okay, then using the sort of cis notation, this is therefore R1, R2, cis, theta 1 plus theta 2. And, okay, uh, so it's just as I, uh, as I promised, um, if you have two arbitrary complex numbers and you uh, multiply them together, then the product uh, is R1, R2 away from the origin on the complex plane, and the angle is now the sum of these two angles. And I guess uh, maybe, maybe even a better way to think about it is if I have one complex number, like say this one, and I multiply it by another complex number, what does, this second comp what does multiplying by this second complex number do? Answer, it rotates this complex number by an additional angle, theta 2, and it increases uh, by a factor of r2, uh, the distance we are away. So this is exactly what I said last class, right? Every time you multiply by a complex number, you perform a rotation and a dilation. You dilate by the, um, the, by the, the, the magnitude of that complex number, and you rotate by the angle that that complex number makes with the positive real axis. Okay, uh, why should I care about this? Well, what this means is that if I have some complex number, r cis theta, and I raise it to the nth power, well, now that's like r cis, let's try to squeeze this in, that's like r cis theta times r cis theta times r cis theta um, n times. But of course, if I do this n times, uh, then that's just like, if I do n of these, then what I get is a, um, a, a, a complex number whose magnitude is r to the n and which has been rotated by n theta. All right, and this is what's known as de Moivre's theorem. De Moivre's theorem says that if you take a complex number, like uh, written in um, this trig form, and you raise it to the nth power, then you get r to the n cis theta n. Okay. Uh, why should I care about this? Uh, well, it now gives me uh, an opportunity to, um, so this is all just to kind of review, it gives me an opportunity to, to be able to easily find the roots of x to the fourth plus one. Uh, and so, uh, I kind of return to this problem now, I guess. Uh, yeah, let's go. Um, I return to this to this problem, and, all right, uh, how, do we, how do we solve it? Well, really what I want to do is I want to solve the equation, when is x to the fourth plus one equal to zero? That's what it really means to, to find the roots after all. So that's kind of like another way of saying, well, x to the fourth is negative one, let's solve this equation. Uh, okay, uh, I guess I, I know how to, to solve this equation. Uh, one way is to uh, express this number, negative 1, in uh, polar form. What is negative 1? Well, negative 1 on the complex plane is right over here. And how should I think of negative 1? I should think of it as, uh, as a number which has been rotated by 180 degrees and from the positive real axis and magnitude 1. In other words, instead of saying x to the fourth equals negative 1, I rewrite x to the fourth as um, 1, uh, well, 1 cis um, pi. Okay, but of course, it's lame to write a 1 there, but that r is just 1, so it's just cis pi. Okay, this is bizarre if you've never seen this before, 
Um, but of course you have seen this before, last year, uh, you might still find it bizarre. I would just like to say really quick that this is not anything, there's actually nothing crazy going on here if you just continue to remind yourself what the cis notation actually means. Cis theta is just uh, shorthand for cosine, uh, sorry, cis pi is just shorthand for cosine pi plus i sine pi. And of course, uh, cosine pi is negative 1, and sine pi is 0. So this really is just a kind of creative way of saying negative 1. Um, why do I want to, to write negative 1 in this strange form? Well, it's because uh, when I express my complex number in polar form, I can uh, apply de Moivre's theorem to it. And so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to sort of raise both sides of this equation to the power of one-fourth. Uh, and if I do that, so, uh, okay, this is, so just sort of do this, that's my sort of notation of what it is I'm doing, uh, then, uh, okay, well, x to the, to the fourth, but raised to the one-fourth, well, that's just x now. And what is uh, cis pi um, raised to the one-fourth? Uh, well, uh, de Moivre's theorem says that this is just going to be 1 to the 1 fourth times cis uh, to the pi times 1 fourth. Okay, and <clears throat> of course that uh, is, uh, well, what is it? Cis pi over 4 is just shorthand for cosine pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 4, and what is that? Cosine pi over 4 is, is root 2 over 2, and sine pi over 4 is also root 2 over 2. Okay, so, uh, quite shockingly, if you, if you weren't expecting this, it's quite a shock to, to find that uh, this is one of the roots of uh, this, this polynomial, x to the fourth plus one. Uh, this number, root two over two plus i root two over two. And, okay, uh, where did this come from again? It came from just evaluating cosine pi over four and sine pi over four, uh, and this is just shorthand for this, and this is just that. Um, some people might buy, find this a little bit objectionable because after all, it seems as if, uh, it seems as if, um, you know, de Moivre's theorem only applies to, like, integers or something like that. Uh, and you're kind of right. So, uh, so really what my, my, my sort of claim I'm making is that um, x equals uh, cis pi over 4 uh, is a solution. And why is x equals cis pi over 4 a solution? The reason is because the de Moivre's theorem says that if I um, uh, raise both sides to the fourth power, then, well, if I raise both sides of the fourth power, de Moivre's theorem says that cis pi over 4 raised to the fourth power is cis pi. And cis pi, as we've seen, is just negative 1. So this, to me, is like the deep explanation, uh, the deep sort of thorough explanation of why uh, this, this method uh, works. De Moivre's theorem says that this is a solution because um, if you raise it to the fourth power, then cis pi over four to the fourth power is cis pi over four times four, which is cis pi, which is negative one. Uh, and so, sort of, uh, if you if you run this logic backwards, it shows that uh, we can sort of also apply De Moivre's theorem, you know, to to the one fourth. Okay, so that's good. Uh, this is good. Uh, I don't necessarily understand what's going on yet. And furthermore, uh, didn't you tell me? So, so the good news is. I have expressed this complex number in the form uh, a plus bi, which I already said at the outset was the only way I was going to be sort of convinced uh, that, you, that you were done with this problem, uh, which shows it's a complex number, but that's only one of the four roots. So what are the other roots? Well, in order to do that, I take a step back, and uh, at this moment, when I set x to the fourth equals negative one, and chose to write, x now, there are many different ways of doing this, uh, all kinds of different sort of uh, notations and textbooks and teachers do it slightly differently and it doesn't really matter uh, exactly how you do it, but the way that to me seems the most uh, natural is at the moment when I go to write uh, negative one as cis pi, 
What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to write this equation four different ways. I'm going to write it as cis pi, but I'm also going to write it as cis 3 pi. And here's the thing, cis 3 pi is just also negative 1. It just is. Because <clears throat> the cosine of 3 pi is negative 1, and the sine of 3 pi is 0. In other words, cis pi equals cis 3 pi equals cis pi. Of course it does, because all I did was rotate around 2, two pi more. Um, and so, uh, the way that to me seems the most um, logical and the most kind of straightforward is when solving equations like this, if I know fundamental theorem of algebra tells me that um, this polynomial has exactly four roots, uh, and another way of thinking about that is that this equation is going to have precisely four solutions, so if this equation has four solutions, then I simply choose to write negative one uh, in four different ways. And each of these four numbers is just a strange and fancy way of saying negative one. Uh, and now, when I apply De Moivre's theorem, I simply raise both sides of this equation to the one-fourth power. And when I do that, I get cis pi over four, uh, cis uh, 3 pi over 4, uh, cis 5 pi over 4, and cis 7 pi over 4. And each of these four answers now can be rewritten in uh, a plus bi form, if you so desire, because um, cis pi over 4 just really means cosine pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 4, as we've seen. So this one is like root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2 i, this one is, uh, well, that's 3 pi over 4, so that's negative root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2i. This one is uh, negative root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2i. And this one is root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2i. And so, <clears throat> if your goal was, and this was our goal, to find the four complex roots of this polynomial, uh, written in standard form, we are done. These are, these are the four answers. Uh, okay, <clears throat> the last thing to do is to try to get some kind of visual understanding of this. And in fact, this entire problem can be done kind of like in one second or something once you, once you sort of get it uh, geometrically. And so let's plot these four answers uh, on the complex plane and observe something about them. So there's kind of this, there's this sort of circle of radius 1, well, okay, it's the unit circle, and what are these four numbers? Well, one solution is this one right here. That is uh, root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2i. Uh, and another solution is that one, and that's the other solution, and that's the other solution. Okay, so um, what's, what's sort of special about these four solutions is they're sort of like spread around uh, the unit circle uh, at a distance, you know, kind of 90 degrees apart from each other. All right, so, uh, and that's kind of just always going to happen. Uh, let's see, what's this? Um, I don't know if it's worth it writing these all out again. Um, and over here we have uh, negative root 2 over 2 uh, minus root 2 over 2 i and uh, negative root 2 over 2 my, um, plus... Sorry, root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2i. Okay, so what's up with this? Um, uh, well, what's up with sort of understanding this figure? Well, okay, come on, what am I really doing? I'm really saying, what for what numbers is it the case that, maybe this is the place to look, for what numbers is it the case that when you raise them to the fourth power, you get negative 1? But if you have fully accepted into your heart that complex numbers are in rotation and a dilation, in this case, uh, since all of these four numbers all have distance 1 from the origin, then there's no dilation, right? Each one of these complex numbers is actually just a pure rotation. Why should intuitively we feel that this first number right here uh, be, a, uh, be a solution to x to the fourth equals negative 1? Well, because what is this? What is this number? It's actually it's actually clearer if you if you think of this as just as just cis pi over four, which is which is of course what it is. 
Um, well, if this number is cis pi over 4, then every time you multiply by cis pi over 4, you rotate by pi over 4. And so to say that x to the 4th is negative 1 is just to state the fact that uh, if you start with, you know, nothing, and you just do four multiplications of cis pi over 4, well, what happens? You rotate by pi over 4, you rotate by pi over 4, you rotate by pi over 4, and you rotate by pi over 4 again, and, oh, sure enough, you end up right here at negative 1. <clears throat> so that's negative 1 on the complex plane, and the fact that cis pi over 4 is a solution is merely the observation that four rotations by pi over 4 land you at negative 1. Ah, well then the rest of these all make sense as well, because what is this? This is cis 3 pi over 4. Well, why should that be a solution? Well, because if you rotate four times by 3 pi over 4, let's see what happens to you. That's 1, then that's 2, then that's 3, and then that's 4. So if you multiply by cis 3 pi over 4 four times, you end up ba also back at negative 1, but this time having gone one and a half times around the circle. And okay, and the rest of these are just the same, right? This is cis uh, 5 pi over 4, uh, and uh, uh, my claim is that if you just perform this rotation four times, you will also end up at negative 1, which is just obviously true, because... 5 pi over 4, another 5 pi over 4, another 5 pi over 4, and another 5 pi over 4 lands you back at negative 1. Okay, I'm not going to do the last one. Alright, so, uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned what complex numbers really are, their rotation and dilation. We've reviewed uh, putting complex numbers in polar form. We've proved that the, uh, the thing about multiplying two complex numbers uh, in, in polar form. We've uh, re-derived uh, De Moivre's theorem. We've discussed how it can be used to solve equations. And we sort of come up with this technique here. So, all right, feel free to stop uh, the video now, I guess. Uh, I'm going to do one more example uh, just to make sure that you, that you get it. I guess you should keep watching this example. But um, I have so, uh, uh, um, I'm going to try to say almost nothing now and just kind of do it. Uh, so this is a little bit more complicated example, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, let's see. I'll do x to the 6th uh, minus 64. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, f of x equals x to the 6th minus 64. Well, this is a 6 degree polynomial. It should have 6 complex roots. Uh, 2 is a root, and so is negative 2. So just notice that that's just a thing, right? f of 2, uh, 2 to the 6 is 64, so that's 0, but then f of negative 2 is also 0. So that's a sort of 2 down, uh, 4 to go, or something like that. And actually, there are ways to do this problem using like pre-calc A knowledge only, uh, with difference of cubes and difference of squares and stuff like that. But I don't want to do that right now. Uh, so instead, uh, let's do it the way we just learned. All right, so, so what are the roots? That's our goal. Uh, find the roots. Well, finding the roots of this is equivalent to solving the equation x to the 6th equals 64. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, how am I going to do that? Well, the number 64 is sitting here on the real axis. That's like kind of not rotating at all, right? Um, so, in fact, Though it is sort of awkward to do so, I'm going to think of 64 as 64 cis 0. Okay, and what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to write x to the 6th in six different ways. It's 64 cis 0, but it's also 64 cis 2 pi, and it's also 64 cis 4 pi, and it's also 64 cis 6 pi, and 64 cis 8 pi, oh man, 1, 2, 3, yeah, and 64 cis 10 pi. Why did I do this six times? Because I know I'm going to get six, uh, I know that this um, equation has exactly six roots, uh, and these are all just different weird ways of saying 64, uh, because cosine is, um, of all of these angles is, is 1, and the sine of all of them is 0. Okay, so having done that, I can now apply De Moivre's theorem, and I can write 
uh, x as raised both sides to the one-sixth power, basically. Maybe I should even uh, write that in. Um, so you sort of, sort of raise x to the sixth to the one-sixth, and you raise all of this to the one-sixth. And, uh, okay, when you do that, you, you, you have this de Moivre's theorem, which says that our cis theta is r to the n cis theta n, uh, and so, uh, 64 to the 1 6th power is just 2, and so the end result of all of this is we get, I get 2 uh, cis 0, but I also get uh, 2 cis, uh, now I'm multiplying by 1 6, so that's 2 cis pi over 3. Uh, here I get uh, 2 cis 4 pi over 6, so that's 2 pi over 3, uh, 2 uh, cis uh, pi two cis eight pi over six, so that's two cis four pi over three, and finally I get ten pi uh, divided by six is two uh, cis five pi over six. No, five pi over three. Uh, okay, so um, the nice thing is that actually all of these, uh, so these are the six answers, but that feels a little bit abstract. Uh, we can make this more concrete by expanding these out. What is 2 cis 0? I'm just now thinking kind of geometrically. Well, it's the complex number with radius 2 but angle 0. Well, that's just 2. Um, and what is 2 cis pi over 3? Okay, I really don't know if you guys can do this in your head, but I can. Uh, you're just making the complex number whose, whose, whose magnitude is 2, but which has been rotated by pi over 3. So that's just kind of like over 1, upward 3. So this is just 1 plus um, uh, i root 3. Uh, in other words, it's just, it's just, it's just kind of like the pi over 3 on the unit circle, right? 1 half root 3 over 2, but just expanded by a factor of 2. And what's uh, 2 pi over 3? Uh, also picturing the unit circle, but dilate by 2. That's just negative 1 plus i root 3. And 2 cis pi, of course, that's just radius 2, but rotated by 180 degrees. That's negative 2, which I already knew because duh is a solution. And 2 cis 4 pi over 3 is going to be a negative 1 minus i root 3. And finally, uh, 2 cis 5 pi over 3 is 1 uh, minus uh, i root 3. Again, I'm just in my head, I'm going to the point 5 pi over 3 in the unit circle, uh, and then just uh, multiplying it by 2. Okay, so uh, the answer, if all I cared about was getting the answer, then these six numbers, uh, which have all been, you know, written in standard form for complex numbers, A plus BI form, uh, all are uh, solutions to the equation x to the sixth equals 64, and so, so they are the roots of f. Uh, so these are the roots. So, so we're sort of done. Uh, the only thing left to do is kind of optional, which is to sort of understand this or something. And if you want to understand it, well, then you just kind of picture them all living on a circle of radius 2. So that's 2. That's, uh, you know, 1 plus i root 3. That's uh, negative 1 plus i 3. That's negative 2. That's 2. Uh, that's negative 2. 1 minus i root 3, and that's um, neg uh, positive 1 minus i root 3. Okay, uh, 1 minus i root 3. All right, so, so what, some, what some people say about this is that, you know, the, the solutions will always kind of lie on, like, the vertices of a polygon, um, a regular polygon. Uh, well, that's just because every regular polygon uh, is sort of circumscribable. So I think the real, the real answer is that uh, anytime you have some kind of equation like this, uh, the, the, the solutions are going to be equally spaced uh, around a circle. Well, they're all, of course, going to have the same magnitude, in this case, 2. And why is that? Because ultimately, and this, this goes back to what I was kind of saying before, if you want to think sort of deeply about this equation, x to the 6th equals 64, and why each of these is a solution, well... Uh, take each of these numbers and now just sort of do it six times and see that you get 64. Well, this first answer, 2, 
uh, two cis zero, uh, well that just says if you're at two and you don't rotate at all, so now you just dilate sort of six times. So two and then two, and then times two times two times two. Okay, that one was kind of lame. Uh, how about consider this one? One plus i root three. Well that really should be thought of as two cis pi over three. So why, why is two cis pi over three, uh, since that, that, that's pi over three right there, why is that uh, an intuitively a solution? Well, because if I, if I start with, say, the number one, and I dilate by two uh, and rotate by pi over three, then dilate by two again and rotate by pi over three again, and dilate by two and rotate by pi over three, 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 well, once I've rotated by pi over three six times, I've gone exactly all the way around the circle and I'm back on the real axis. But each time if I dilate by two, so dilate by two, dilate by two, dilate by two, dilate by two, once I've dilated by two six times and rotated by pi over three six times, then indeed I am here at 64. So you can, you can kind of like imagine sort of a picture of this sort of going, it's like jump, 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 and you sort of each time you're wrapping around, uh, rotating by pi over 3, dilating by 2. After doing that six times, you clearly just get 64. And for the rest of these, it's more complicated because here, this is now a sort of 2 pi over 3. So now, if you do 2 pi over 3 six times, you go around the circle twice, but you also land back here on the positive real axis. And since each time you dilated by 2, once you've done that six times, you're back, you're back at 64. Alright, this video is a good example of how I never give this lesson in a normal year. So, Zoom school sucks, the pandemic sucks, but if you actually watched all the way to the end of this thing, you're getting a superior education to the normal year of a normal uh, pre-calc student, but you have to watch this whole damn video, so that's terrible. Uh, Alright, I hope everyone gets this. Uh, see you back at school.